This is me driving in what I think is one of the most bizarre places in the world. I just crossed over from Israel into the West Bank. If you look at a map of where I'm driving right now, you'll see a jumbled mess of Palestinian towns and villages, which are shown in green, and Israeli settlements, which are in blue. Many people think of this territory as Palestine, but of the 3 million people living out here, almost 20% of them are Jewish Israeli citizens. The Israelis living out here are called settlers. They live in the West Bank, but they're citizens of Israel. As I drive, I'm looking at effectively two different nations woven into each other through decades of conflict. I visited 15 settlements all over the West Bank, talking to people who have decided to pack up and move out into the middle of disputed land. We'll meet them in coming videos, but first I want to take a look at the maps that help explain how the West Bank got to look like this. So let's go back to 1948 when the map looked a lot different. Back then, all this land was controlled by Great Britain. And due to growing tensions between Jews and Arabs, the UN worked with Britain to split the land into two states. One for Jews, Israel, and another one for Arabs, Palestine. The Jews in the region accepted this plan and declared independence of the state of Israel. But the Arab states in the region saw this plan as just more European colonialism. They didn't accept the plan and instead declared war on Israel. Israel won the war, pushing well past the borders of the UN plan. During the peace negotiations, a ceasefire line was drawn in green ink. It became known as the Green Line. It wasn't necessarily a border, it was just a ceasefire line, with this being the state of Israel, and this section being controlled by Jordan, who had taken control of it during the war. The Jordanians named this newly seized land the West Bank because it was west of the Jordan River. The fragile ceasefire remained until 1967 when Israel fought another war with its Arab neighbors. Israel wasn't looking to take over land in this war, but in just six days of fighting, it blew past the Green Line and seized a whole swath of land, including the entire West Bank. Suddenly, Israel had a decision to make. Do they make the West Bank a part of Israel and give the 1.1 million Arabs living there Israeli citizenship and voting rights? Do they give the land back to their enemy Jordan? Or else do they let the people create their own Palestinian state? This became a major debate in Israeli politics. Many Israelis saw this war they just won as not just a military victory, but a religious sign that the Jews were meant to return to the place where a huge amount of Jewish history happened the hills of the ancient Judea and Samaria, which is basically the entire West Bank. So while the government was debating what to do, Israeli civilians began moving into the West Bank without any permission from the government. They just started setting up homes, establishing a Jewish presence in this region. Suddenly, any debate about what to do with the West Bank had to take into account the growing number of Israeli civilians that were living there. But the rest of the world did not approve of this. As the settler presence grew, the UN issued a resolution saying that the settlements had no legal validity and that they constitute a serious obstruction to achieving a comprehensive, just, and lasting peace in the Middle East. They were basically saying that this settler activity was totally illegal. Two different narratives emerged here. One said that Jewish civilians were moving on to mostly empty plots of land that they had captured in a war and that had deep historical and spiritual significance to them. The other side, which is the side that most of the world took, said that these settlers were colonizing land to expand their nation. In spite of international condemnation, the number of settlers in the West Bank grew. Over the next few decades, more and more factions of the Israeli government began to support the settler movement, allocating public resources and granting permits for building. The Israeli housing ministry and military began developing plans on how to develop the West Bank. They built roads throughout the entire region, allowing easy access between the settlements and mainland Israel. More and more building permits were given out and planned communities began popping up all over the West Bank. The settlements slowly shifted from a fringe group of motivated civilians to an institutionalized part of Israeli society, totally supported by the state. Here are the Palestinian towns in the West Bank. Watch how the settlements weave throughout these Palestinian towns. Palestinians didn't like this encroachment. They began protesting, often with extreme violence. Between the violence and the condemnations from the international community of the settlements, the situation became unsustainable. 
So, in the mid-1990s, American President Bill Clinton, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat signed the Oslo Accords, agreements that established a Palestinian government and split the West Bank into three sections. Area A gave Palestinians total control over security and government. This makes up about 18% of the West Bank, but most of the Palestinian population centers are here. This was a big deal because it gave Palestinians self-rule for the first time. Area B was designated for Palestinian government control while retaining Israeli security control, meaning the Israeli military remains very present there. Area B is about 22% of the West Bank. Area C remained completely under the Israeli military and government control. This is where all the settlements are in Area C. It's about 60% of the West Bank. So this is basically how we ended up with this mess of a map. Israelis can come and go from mainland Israel through really nice roads that go straight to the settlements. They call these roads flyovers because they bypass Palestinian villages and give easy access from one settlement to the other. But not every settlement has one of these flyover roads. Palestinians can drive on almost all the roads in the West Bank, but their movement is often more difficult, more restricted. They have to stop at checkpoints and get their car inspected sometimes. Sometimes it makes for some really long lines. But certainly one of the most difficult aspects of this carved up land situation is how it hinders Palestinians from being able to build an economy. Area C, which is under Israeli control, contains the majority of the West Bank's agricultural land, as well as the water and mineral resources. Palestinian companies are severely restricted in accessing these resources, which takes a huge hit on their economy. So with these three sections agreed upon by both sides, the settlements continued to grow in Area C. But in 2005, something happened that would ignite even more passion for the settler movement in Israel. Prime Minister Ariel Sharon decided to remove 8,500 settlers from the Gaza Strip, which was another disputed area where there was a lot of settlements. Seeing Israelis forcibly evicted, their homes demolished, left a huge mark on the country, especially the settlers. They immediately redoubled their effort to settle the West Bank, and the numbers continued to grow. Most people who think about a resolution to this conflict propose a two-state solution, meaning giving the Palestinians a state somewhere in this West Bank region. But if you look at this map, you can start to see that it's getting harder and harder to do that. The settlers living in the West Bank are not living in tents or caravans. They're living in developed communities with schools and hospitals and even a university. It's not going to be that easy to uproot these communities. In the next video, I'll go inside the settlements and talk to the people who are living there. Jewish people have come home. That's, that's not going to change. Who are these nutcases who are moving out of their own will into this battle zone? They fail to realize the lifestyle that we actually have here. I don't consider myself a settler, maybe, but I know other people do just because I cross a certain line and I go through a certain post. That's me driving towards an unauthorized outpost deep into the West Bank. And when I got to the outpost, I expected the family I was meeting with to hit me with an earful of ideology and a sermon on why the Jews deserve to live in this land more than the Palestinians do. Instead, we played music. We ate food from their land and we talked more about the perks of living in the desert. Close to Jerusalem, the best view, the best weather. Uh -huh. Close to my parents. Yeah. Excellent, it's perfect. These people don't own guns. They don't lock their doors. I visited 15 settlements out here in the West Bank to find out what motivates the people who are at the forefront of one of the world's most difficult and protracted conflicts. The West Bank is home to 2.2 million Arabs and seen by the international community as the part of a future Palestinian state. But there are also more than 400,000 Israeli settlers living out here, which is about 5% of Israel's population. You can learn all about how they got here in the first part of this series. Many of the first Jewish settlers who trekked out here in 1967 were driven by a strong ideological mission to claim this land for Israel. But things have changed quite a bit since then. What is it? What is it? Of last year. Harry, 
Okay, and then Murphy carried them to the playoffs. Spend 10 minutes in a settlement today, and you sometimes feel yeah, that you Murphy could just as easily be in a New Jersey so suburb. Walker has been out the last three days because he's got a back problem and his wife is due. We're, we're here just to, you know, play a game, have a good time. Clean roads, big houses, quality parks, good schools, close by shopping, a university. You ask people why they moved out here, and instead of the original mission to push forward the Israeli state, you hear things like... A very good educational system. So this is a very nice um, country club. We wanted to be able to have a bigger place. It's a great place to raise kids. It's, it's a beautiful view and it's, it's our beautiful land and I love looking at it all the time. We were looking for a Jerusalem suburb that we could afford that was a manageable commute. Close to Jerusalem, extremely close to Jerusalem. The quality of life is so much better. It has nothing to do with politics. And having a little bit more quiet. Most people here work in the city and you come back here at night, you come back here in the afternoon and it's just relaxing and quiet. Between the puppet show for the kids, the bump in bar mitzvah party, and the hundred other examples of seemingly ordinary suburban life, it's hard to remember that these settlers are living at the edge of an intense conflict. My wife and I had certain criteria. One was we wanted to walk out of our back door and be hiking in five minutes. Now, of course, there's still ideology here. Many residents of these communities feel connected to the settlers' original mission to resettle the hills of the ancient Judean Samaria from the Bible, which they call the cradle of our entire civilization. Yeah. But ideological motivations for living out here are usually four or five items down the priority list with quality of life reasons being the main drivers. To tell you if my ideological reasons was the major motivation to move over, uh, I won't lie and that wasn't one of the major uh, things. I wasn't trying to make a statement. I was trying to find a place that would be a good place, a safe place to raise our kids. And this was the choice. It wasn't at all something that was something that was like one of the criteria, but, but it happened to be a, a real, real perk. Of course, the hardcore, back-to-the-earth settlers still exist. Here I am with a guy who doesn't want his name or face in my video. He lives in another outpost, illegal even to the Israeli government. There's no baseball league or bagel shops in this community. God promised to us that this, are, this is our land and we can, we can uh, grow here uh, if we listen to him. This renegade culture of taking over hilltops once characterized the settlement movement. But now, the zealous ideology that started the movement has been diluted by more practical factors like house prices and quality of schools. This real estate ad for a settlement community, I think, perfectly captures the blend of quality of life motivations with a hint of ideological fervor sprinkled in. If you've always felt a deep yearning for Jerusalem, now, is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, not only to stand within its gates, but also to build the home of your dreams there. The tranquility of a picturesque setting and crisp mountain air, with all the benefits and amenities that Jerusalem has to offer. Ramat Gibat Ze'ev is adjacent to the city of Gibat Ze'ev and is connected to Jerusalem via two main highways. But make no mistake, there's still a conflict here, an occupation of land that has enormous impact on the lives of Palestinians. Just, it sounds paradoxical, but this just seems like the safest place in the world. One of the reasons why life in many settlements is so peaceful and pleasant is that the government invests proportionally more public money into the settlement communities than it does in mainland Israeli communities. Schools in the settlements receive better funding than mainland Israeli schools in the form of better salaries for teachers and other educational benefits for the kids. Nearly one third of all subsidized housing in Israel is in the settlements, even though only 5% of Israelis live there. And in the past, the government even ran a mortgage subsidy program that made living out here much cheaper than mainland Israel. And things like public transportation are cheaper for settlers than mainland Israelis. An Israeli think tank found that the government spends about $950 on each West Bank resident. That's more than double what it spends on people living in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. The settlement enterprise has become a fixture of Israeli institutions 
in society, which helps explain why you don't need to be an ideological activist if you want to live out there. I can't hide the quality of life that people are enjoying here, okay? I can't hide the fact that people are moving from the United States from very luxurious big homes and they choose to live in a front. And they're not suffering in a front, okay? They're managing to maintain a very similar quality of life. On top of government support, lots of the gyms, theaters, and parks in the settlements are funded by foreign donors, usually Americans, with ideological motivations. So what you end up with are these attractive communities that feel totally ordinary and livable, but that are built on an ideological mission and that carry heavy political significance both domestically and internationally. Even these unauthorized outposts that are illegal under Israeli law enjoy a good amount of support from the government. Like this government provided soldier to protect this illegal community, or a playground that's built by the government, as well as public waste and recycling collection, all in a place that has been deemed illegal by the government. My house, the government built it. <laughs> uh, that's the fact. That's a fact. These places are connected to public water and electricity. They're totally supported in spite of being unauthorized. And we have here everything from internet to water to electricity to, like, everywhere. But often to appease the international community, the government still tries to appear tough on these unauthorized settlements. Back on that illegal outpost, my contact tells me that the authorities show up about once a year to knock down a settler's house and then take a picture of it to show the world that they don't tolerate illegal settlements. But in reality, they clearly do. And most of the reason is international political reason. Mm -hmm. um, international forces, international uh, political stupid reasons. <laughs> Since 1967, there's been wide government support from both right and left-wing parties in Israeli politics, which both have separate reasons for supporting the settlers. And while this support is not the only or even the main reason why settlements are growing, it has surely helped turn the settler experience into a mainstream, livable, and often enjoyable situation. The original mission of the settlement movement was to claim land deep into the West Bank, preventing a Palestinian state. Here are the Palestinian population centers in the West Bank, and here are the settlements. Any proposal for giving Palestinians their own state now has to take into account the hundreds of thousands of Israelis living out here. No one seriously considers it possible to remove all 400,000 residents. And while negotiations are in a standstill, Israel keeps issuing permits and settlements continue to grow. These whole peace talks are like two guys negotiating over a pizza while one of them is eating a pizza. <laughs> Just a few weeks ago, the housing minister announced that he foresees this region down here, called Gush Etzion, growing from 7,000 residents, which it is currently, to a half a million in the next 10 years. Israeli settlements are universally condemned among the international community, but no matter what you think of them, it's hard to imagine that they're going away anytime soon. What did you think that I was living in? You thought I was living in some sort of tent? That I was riding camels? What, what did you have in your imaginary picture, the settlement movement? There are half a million people living here in solid homes. Before 1996, there were 100,000 Jews living over the Green Line. Today, we're approaching half a million. Um, and that number is just growing. Jewish people have come home. That's, that's not going to change. In this video, I talked to a lot of settlers whose motivations were more practical than ideological. In the next video, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and talk to the settlers who are at the epicenter of the conflict. Settlers whose motivations are certainly much more ideological than practical. I also want to note that in this video, I talked to a lot of American settlers in the West Bank. Americans make up about 15% of the settler population. I also talked to settlers from Holland and Russia and all over the place. The West Bank really is full of settlers from all over the world. 